perfect. Yeah, so I think we, we probably should begin. Thank you, Senator, so much. Um, folks, when you joined the call, your video was off and you were muted. I do believe that is under your control. However, because we have over 100 people registered, we will get a clearer signal if you keep your video off and if you stay muted. The Senator will talk for a little bit and then he will take your questions and the ch questions will come or should come through the chat feature. So if you can open up the little bubble, usually it's at the bottom of your screen, and type your questions into that, then I will moderate those um, after the Senator's remarks and we'll try to get to all of your questions. So that is the plan. And now I'm going to turn it over to our chamber president and CEO, Joe Reardon, to get us started. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. We're very pleased to welcome Missouri senior U.S. Senator Roy Blunt to this morning's virtual town hall event. Senator Blunt has a long record of service to the Show Me State. He served in the U.S. Senate since 2011. He was elected seven times to the U.S. House of Representatives from Missouri's 7th Congressional District, serving from 1997 to 2011. Before that, he served as the Missouri Secretary of State from 1985 to 1993. Senator Blunt currently chairs the Senate Rules Committee, as well as serving on the Senate Appropriations Committee, the Senate Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, and the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. As all of you on the call know, Senator Blunt has been a fantastic partner with the Casey Chamber and we greatly appreciate his steady leadership, especially during these times. Senator Blunt, it's a great privilege to have you join us for this morning's virtual town hall meeting. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Joe, and uh, good to be with you and Kathy and everybody else uh, on the call. Um, let, me, uh, let me give just a couple of introductory remarks, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can handle, and I'll try to keep those answers as short as I can when we get to that. I would say that when uh, you do something as quickly as this big $2.2 trillion package had to be put together, uh, there are clearly problems that I said at the time there would be. I said, we've got to do this, we've got to do it fast, it has to be broad-based, and we will make mistakes, but the biggest mistake would be not acting uh, and so uh, the, the Congress uh, tried to overcome all of its normal uh, obstacles dealing with each other and, uh, and it did, did get this done. Basically, there are four parts to the, the, the part three. You know, we, all, we did an early health care issue of funding. We did another one that basically tried to help people in that first two weeks of staying at home. And then we got to this big $2.2 trillion issue. Uh, one part was direct payments. Most Missourians will get one, and uh, hopefully those will go out by mid-April. I think the Secretary of the Treasury on all of these topics is finding out just how big the obstacles are of getting government to move as quickly as he thought it, need, it could move and as we hoped it would uh, move. But uh, most Missourians will get a direct payment uh, if you're two up, if two working adults at a house make less than $150,000, they'll each get $1,200. And if there are children at that house uh, that, that qualify, they get $500. So you know, the traditional family of four, two adults, two kids, and be 1,200 times two, 24, and 500 times two, another thousand. Uh, they get a $3,400. Uh, payment normally deposited directly into whatever account you've given IRS in the past couple of years as to where you'd like your refund to go if you had one. And I think most people fill that out, even if they believe they're unlikely to get a refund, they still are asked to give that information and normally do. Social Security recipients who don't file tax returns, many Social Security recipients do, but Social Security recipients who don't will also get a, a check at the $1,200 rate um, if they made less than $75,000, and then that that goes to zero somewhere between 75 and 100. This kind of goes down every amount of income until you get to 100. Then nobody 
no individual over 100,000 gets that direct payment. Small business, probably be the quickest uh, oversubscribed amount of money of all of this, uh, $360 billion, almost totally designed in a way that uh, encourages an employer to keep their employees on their payroll uh, with whatever benefits they would have with the understanding that if you're on the payroll when the business opens back up or gears back up, uh, those employees are there and never transition from your payroll to the unemployment roles, though clearly a lot of people are gonna to go to the unemployment roles for lots of different reasons, not the least of which is uh, that um, it was decided uh, that uh, unemployment would be increased by $600 a week for I think the first eight weeks, it may be even more than that, but if you get the normal Missouri or Kansas benefit, and then you add $600 to that, a substantial number of people would make more on unemployment than they would have made at work. And uh, they know that, and their employer knows that. And, you know, we've seen the unemployment rolls expand by 10 million people at least in the last two weeks and have no reason to believe that this week won't be a week that is similar to that. Uh, then some uh, after small business, there's a critical industries piece, mostly focused on aviation and travel. Uh, and then um, healthcare, the part of the bill that uh, my team on the, on the HHS, Labor HHS uh, Appropriating Committee wrote, uh, the biggest amount in healthcare is $100 billion to hospitals. I think we have every reason to believe that the first 30 billion of that or so will start going out uh, on Friday to hospitals based on a formula reflective of the work that in many cases they w have not done. You know, hospitals have, because of personal protective equipment and other reasons, been asked to stand down from elective procedures, and that has an incredible financial impact on hospitals. There was another $50 billion for other purposes, including $16 billion for personal protective equipment, uh, and um, so those were the four buckets, the direct payments, the small business uh, loans, the critical industries, uh, and health care. And um, I think maybe we can go to questions and solve as much of this as otherwise. I will say, let me say one other thing on the health care front. I spent a lot of time the last three days with uh, Francis Collins, who is the director of NIH, and Dr. Hahn at FDA and some other people uh, trying to get focused also on a test to determine if you've had this or not, a test to determine if you have the antibodies that would indicate you've had this. There is a widely held belief that a lot of people have had over the last 90 days coronavirus 19, COVID-19, and don't know that they've had it. They know they felt bad for a couple of days, but they don't know exactly why. Uh, the test up till now would tell you if you had it or not. It wouldn't tell you if you have had it in the past. It would just tell you if you had it or not at the moment you take the test. We're trying hard to work on tests that would be out there uh, increasingly from the end of April on over the course of the summer in significant numbers that the government would pay for that would tell you if you had had this and there is a uh, growing um, belief among the scientific community that if you've had it, that you are likely immune from catching it at least for a while, which I assume would take you at least till this time next year, we would hope, and maybe, maybe it's longer than that. But the antibody test, probably a pinprick, um, probably available at lots of places, including uh, your local pharmacy that you would go, they'd take that test. I don't know how long, but it shouldn't take long to tell you, uh, you yes, you have those uh, COVID-19 antibodies, so you must have had this and you must have fought it off or you wouldn't have the antibodies. You know, the we believe no human had ever had this until December of last year. So it is, uh, that's why it's the novel COVID-19. And there's no way you'd have the antibodies for it 
if that's true, if you hadn't had it uh, in the in the last uh, time between December and the time you would uh, you would take this test. So um, let's let's go to whatever you want to talk about. And again, I'm glad to work for you. I'm glad to have a chance to be with you today and. I'm very anxious to do what we can to beat the virus on one front and get the economy started back toward where it was in February on the other front. Wonderful, Senator. Thank you. We've got several questions right now on um, the potential for a phase four package. And um, I'll try to wrap these up into to one. We've got um, some folks asking, is there any chance that there would be a phase four and that Congress would consider um, an infrastructure package within phase four? Now when the country, I'm reading this, now when the country will need long-term job growth and invest more than ever, is there a chance that Congress will take the lead in developing and determining how to fund a large-scale infrastructure plan before the FAST Act Buyers. And then uh, I'll just add on to that another question about would uh, Congress potentially in a phase four um, consider funding um, testing equipment? And there are a couple of people, a number of people who believe that if we could do more testing, that we could get ahead of this um, crisis and um, you know, really put our states in better position to, to deal with it. So two questions there on a phase four. All right, on the, uh, if I can remember those two or three questions, one was um, phase four. There, there'd definitely be a phase four. Now, my view, which may not prevail, would be that as soon as we can get to it, which would be, I, I assume, later this month, that we use a quick phase four to correct the problems of phase three and do that as quickly as we can. There may be too much desire to go ahead and go to what Speaker Pelosi's referring to as something that would be at least a trillion more dollars. Um, and uh, um, I think if you, my view would be if you do that, you probably should be waiting on that until late May and see where the economy is by late May and whether we need to do everything I just mentioned at another level. Do there need to be another series of direct payments? Uh, do there need to, do we need to expand the small business loan number? Uh, critical industries uh, certainly we're going to have to do more for. Healthcare, and you know that might be part of a, even a, even the a skinny phase four. But there'll be a phase four. My guess is there's also a phase five. Uh, you know, we've never seen anything like this. And the longer the economy is shut down, as it is in the country today, the longer it will take us to come back. Uh, so whatever we can do to figure out how to reignite that recovery. Um, and um, with our goal, obviously, being if we get back to where we were uh, early February of this year in, in what in many ways was the strongest economy anybody had seen in the United States since World War II, or at least since the, the decade after World War II, uh, who knows? So there will be a phase four. I think there'll probably also be a phase five. I'd stage that a little differently and give us a little time before we get into a trillion dollar discussion to know exactly where that trillion dollars needs to go. I think that ideally is more of a late May package than a late April package, uh, but there'll be a phase four. And as many of you know, in late April, there are plenty of concerns about how the direct payments, the small business loans, the healthcare money has gone that, uh, I think could be handled without much argument, uh, and uh, and we'll see. Infrastructure, I'd love to do infrastructure. You know, as I've said to many of you many times, uh, the country is incredibly well located. Uh, we benefit, the whole country benefits from uh, infrastructure that works. Where we live, we benefit more 
than most of the country does because frankly location is our biggest advantage in our state you know the railroads come together the highways come together the rivers come together uh, where we live unlike they do virtually anywhere else and uh, we always have a vested interest in that i wish we'd have done it in 2017. Um, president made the point yesterday that uh, certainly you're never going to borrow money cheaper than you're going to borrow it now, so borrow it and put it into infrastructure, and uh, um, we'll see where that goes. This is the great white whale of the Trump administration. Um, it's been chased every quarter at least since 2017. This would be the, maybe let's say every six months, this would be the, okay, it's now time to do the infrastructure package. I hope we can do it, but uh, uh, I, and I'm for it. I don't know that it will be part of that big package or not. Speaker wanted it to be a week ago. She backed away from that uh, two or three days ago. Uh, and um, can you do a trillion dollar infrastructure package and a trillion dollar recovery package? At what point do these trillion dollars have to stop adding up? But, you know, again, where we live, there's no money you're gonna spend better uh, than infrastructure money, and I would like to see us do that. And then on testing, I think maybe I just answered that right before that question was asked. I think a lot of the focus on testing that will help the economy the most will be testing to know whether people have had this or not and whether they're likely immune because they have had it, which certainly lets some people know that they can go back to work quicker. It lets parents know that if they're son or daughter's already had this, uh, they're going to be safer in a dormitory situation in September from, from this than they would otherwise be. We've got a lot of decisions coming up, many of which would be at, advanced by knowing if you've had this or not. Uh, and um, the more people that have had it, the uh, less important testing to see if you've had it is, obviously, but that doesn't mean that's unimportant. And the government is committed to pay for a test that shows whether you have it or a test that shows whether you have had it in the past. Uh, and so there's a lot of private sector interest, as there should be, in making those tests available because you know you've got millions of potential customers and you've got a guaranteed source of pay uh, why wouldn't you want to do that? Senator, we've got a number of people on the call that are very happy with your two answers, and particularly the infrastructure answers. We're going to be rooting you on to that. Thank you. Good. Good. Um, Good. Moving on to a number of calls here. Um, one um, from the startup community that asks, are VC-backed startups excluded from federal aid? And if so, to what extent can this issue be resolved to accommodate high growth technology companies? And, and, and that would be what kind of backed startups? Oh, I'm sorry, venture capital backed startups? Uh, well, you know, the question is if you are, uh, I think the answer should be yes. I've also been very involved in this the last week. I think the answer should be yes. There are some SBA prohibitions that hinge on how you're structured. Um, the two that are the most simple to understand, for me at least, would be that if uh, your outside investor uh, has less than 50% of the voting ability to direct the company, uh, and also that outside investor couldn't prohibit the company from making decisions by not creating a quorum that would be necessary, uh, always have them present as part of a quorum. So there's an issue of, is, is the outside investor who has 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 other employees or other com companies, are they, are you still a small business or not? Um, I think that these startup companies are so important to the future of the, country and they need venture capital investors whether they're you know called the private equity is sort of has, has really taken a beating here uh, 
in the national discussion, but how do you move forward without private equity if the government's not going to run everything and you don't want the government to run everything? So we're working on that. Uh, I hope we can be more clear about the SBA restrictions that they normally have, that these shouldn't necessarily apply, uh, but there is a private equity barrier right now. Um, so if you've got a small business that doesn't have that barrier and you have less than 500 employees, uh, you're going to likely be in the line before we solve the private equity issue as it relates to businesses that have less than 500 employees that are affiliated with other businesses that have more than 500 employees. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, another question kind of following up on that. Um, I've heard several small businesses are having to complete their applications, I assume IDLE and PPP applications two and three time the CARES Act loans, do you know why that, that's happening? Any commentary about this system? I, I think that has happened some, and I think one of the reasons it's happened some is that uh, um, the um, some of the first applications out there that banks were using and were encouraged to use didn't quite fit uh, the legal needs of this new amount of money that had never been available in this way before that was forgivable if you did certain things. And uh, um, I think it's just the, uh, the problem of trying to start up as fast as you can and starting up maybe a little faster than you should because you didn't have the right documents yet. Everybody's banker, I think bankers want to be helpful to them the Treasury Department wants more banks to be involved than would be involved in the normal SBA 1800 banks in America network uh, and uh, finding out what you need to find out and how you then later get forgiven from that loan is a different set of circumstances than we've had before. I guarantee you nobody is trying to make this work quicker than uh, the administration and particularly than uh, Secretary Mnuchin, who uh, is probably uh, probably uh, exhausted in his involvement in so many different areas, from getting these direct payment checks out to the small business loans to deciding how the airlines should uh, be able to apply for that money. And I'm not saying there's a bottleneck there, but I don't see how it's 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 hard to put that much authority in one place and not have some things happen more slowly than you would like. Understand completely. We're going to pivot a little bit on this next question uh, back to, to health care. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, my screen just blanked off. Okay, here we go. Um, have you heard, do our hospitals in the Kansas City area have all of the PPE and the ventilators they anticipate needing and if not, how is Congress planning to help make sure they do at this time? Um, and then have you heard from any Missouri hospitals who say they anticipate needing additional facilities similar to what we're seeing in New York with the Javits Center or, or Louisiana? Um, any of that that you're familiar with? Well, you know, there are a couple of studies out on this. There are a couple of models. There's a Harvard model and there's a Washington University model trying to figure out what would happen in different states. In those models, our peak, the Missouri peak, and, and I'm, I assume this is similar to Kansas, but I, I truly don't know. The Missouri peak would be anticipated sometime between late April and mid-May. Also in those models, and this would be good news, that, that the Missouri peak would indicate, the anticipated peak in our state would indicate we have plenty of hospital beds. Uh, I don't really know how you know that we have them in the right area or how that all works, but I, I do think that going into the next month, it looks like that we may be well prepared for what we're likely to see. But the truth is, Kathy and Joe and others, we really don't know. I mean, we really don't know how this will impact us, when it impacts us. We don't really know how effective 
the social distancing is. Uh, on the PPE, I talked to talked to probably three dozen of our hospital administrators, uh, and uh, you know they all have various levels of concern because they don't know what they're going to need, and of course they have incredible lost income because they've been holding back. One of the reasons they've been holding back all these elective procedures is because they didn't want to use up the personal protective equipment they had, which is a sad situation to be in. At the same time, I'll add this, there's been a national debate that I don't think has been handled particularly well by the White House about the national stockpile and whether it should be just distributed based on what every hospital in America thinks they're gonna need. I think the reason you have the national stockpile is so it can go where it's needed, when it's needed, and we still have a pretty good, uh, we have an incredibly strong delivery network in the country. Uh, I, I, that stockpile's growing all the time, $16 billion available uh, for it to grow. Um, local hospitals and states are doing what they can to grow their own stockpile. But the idea of the national stockpile is not just so every hospital has everything they think they might need and that they get it free from the federal government. The idea of the national stockpile is hospitals have as much as they can put together. And then if we reach that crisis moment for that hospital, we have that national stockpile. We're not trying to get the national stockpile back from some other place that wound up not having that crisis moment occur. Uh, but I know this is a big problem. It's a big loss of revenue problem. I have spent a lot of time on it. Last night I was on a call with uh, the, the uh, three people from HHS talking about how to begin to get that cash flow started to hospitals. Uh, yesterday during the day I was on a call with uh, people at uh, uh, the, the stockpile group actually figuring out how they can get what people need to them when they need it and when they anticipate with real facts that they're going to need it. Models, models do work here and we're trying to use them as effectively as we can. Well, we truly appreciate you looking out for our Missouri healthcare providers and hospitals and your team. They, they've been great to work with on some of our questions regarding that, so thank you. Here's a little pivot, a little uh, different question. Um, there have been reports that the United States Postal Service will be insolvent by June, possibly as soon as June. Would phase four or phase five possibly address USPS in a bigger way as part of our national, our vital national infrastructure? I think that's possible. We almost did something in phase three and may have, there may even have been a little something there, but it's part of a discussion. Uh, you know, the postal system is challenged. Uh, Senator Moran and I have uh, over and over again sponsored reform measures for the postal system that would uh, allow them to function more effectively and not require them to have um, amounts of money set aside for retirement and other things that are, that exceed what any other business in America would have to do. Um, we, we we haven't ever given up on this. We ha we haven't great success. We've had a couple of little positive uh, upward uh, assistance to the uh, postal service, but. Uh, uh, it, it's not impossible that something like that could be part of one of these uh, relief packages, and uh, it's worth it's certainly worth thinking about. Being home to Hallmark, we uh, love love hearing you say that as well. I've got three questions. Do you think that we would have time to get to them, or should I just take the next one in order? Because I see it's nine o'clock. Well, let's let's do three, and I'll try to be well. It's maybe briefer answers than you want, but I'll try to answer all three of them, and I'm gonna have to go. I certainly understand that. Thank you so much. Um, the next one, what additional relief, if any, is being discussed for tax-exempt service organizations? You know, they can qualify under the uh, small business, um, uh, the, the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, that's a reach beyond anything we've ever done before. 
It's a big exception to all past practices uh, in the law. And also the law includes uh, three significant charitable changes. One would allow people to deduct up to $300, even if they don't itemize, in charitable contributions, church, charity, in all charities. Churches, by the way, qualify for this. If they're in a situation where they would have to lay people off, they can also go and talk about the pay tech, paycheck protection uh, issue. So $300 above the line, uh, The um, I'm from memory here, so I might be wrong uh, on, um, Corporates uh, on, on total income for corporations under the new law, they could give tw up to 25% to charity as opposed to 10, and individuals could give 100% of adjusted gross income and still have it adjust, uh, deductible as opposed to 65. So those are three uh, charitable uh, changes that would help, plus the biggest change of all would be letting not-for-profits get into the same arena with small business in terms of applying for this forgivable, largely forgivable paycheck protection uh, program. Okay, thank you. Um, two, next two question. More, two more? Yeah, two more. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna shoot quickly here. Missouri, our neighboring states, economies are important for the nation because of the importance of farming. Is there any talk in Washington about focusing on protecting our rural states, particularly our community health centers and critical access hospitals. Because if we miss the planting season or tending to the crops and livestock due to widespread illness, it's bad for the country. Any talk about specific aid for rural states? Yes, yes, particularly rural hospitals, very, uh, very above the line issue of awareness that is part of every discussion that relates to hospitals. Uh, and for agriculture, we did a couple of things to the uh, Commodity Credit Corporation uh, and another loan program in the bill that uh, uh, Senator Roberts was particularly uh, aggressive in his efforts to get that done. Perfect, and then here's our final question. Um, have there been, excuse me, have there been discussions regarding a temporary risk mitigation program or programs to ensure health care premiums do not spike and that benefits are stable in the future? And, and the, the writer, the, the asker goes on to say this could be structured as a backstop contingency program that is triggered only if real world health uh, insurer costs are significantly higher than expected. Mm -hmm. um, the I, I haven't I haven't been in a discussion recently on spiking insurance cost. Um, you know, insurance companies actually because of the lack of a lot of elective procedures have probably had less outgo unless you were in a surge COVID area than they would have normally had. Uh, but we'll have to look and see how that all works out. I mean, those rates all have to be approved by somebody, either at the state or federal level. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that's a discussion that uh, I'd want to know a whole lot more about before I got deeply into speculating on what might happen there. Uh, but thanks for letting me be with you this morning. Thanks for letting me work for you. And uh, I look forward to a chance uh, to visit again, either collectively or individually, as I often do with many of the people on this call. Senator, thank you for your time, for your service, for your wonderful team, and um, for being with us today. We just sending you good well wishes for health and success going forward. Thank you again. Well, my, my team is is great, and uh, we've got great people in Kansas City, and Matt Hayes, who runs our state offices, is there, uh, along with uh, Brett Shields and uh, others. And we're, we're uh, I'm, my, my, you know, the the Washington team. I have the I chair the Republican Policy Council, so we have another 
15 policy people that work for every Republican senator, but they work for me first. So that uh, that helps. And uh, our, our, our Washington team, while working uh, at home now, is uh, really constantly engaged. It's almost like there's no longer a five-day week. There's some version of a seven-day week because there's always – something to be done. My chief of staff, uh, Stacey McBride, said the other day, there are now only three days in the week, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, and so we don't count days anymore. We just do whatever work needs to be done, and there is plenty of it right now. Absolutely. Thank you again, Senator. You bet. Great Mister. to be with you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on the call, and we wish you health and a great week. Thank you. Thanks everyone, have a great day.